Okay, fabulous. Yes. Uh, missing links. It's a, it's a terrible pun that um, somebody, somebody on Twitter um, um, came up with a, a few years back. I just, I just thought it was wonderful for a title. Anyway, let's, um, I'm going to give you a bit of a gallop today. Um, I've been working um, as, on something called the Inns on the Edge project that um, you may have seen some mention of on Twitter and various other places. Uh, Lincolnshire County Council Historic England project looking from Grimsby down to Boston um, at the, uh, the origins and fate of the uh, pubs and inns all along the coastline. As part of that, um, they decided they wanted a detailed reconstruction and analysis of the Lincolnshire marshes. Um, which runs down that area. Now, this is an area I'm, I, I've been interested in for many years. Uh, I know Helen's done a lot of work on it as, as well. It's a fascinating wide belt of what are in effect former coastal marshes. It all lies around about one and a half to two and a half metres um, OD. So very low indeed, um, aside from a few islands, as we shall see, sticking up through it. Um, and it's, it's about 10 kilometres wide at its widest, at its narrowest, somewhere around six kilometres wide. And the key question I've been looking at um, has really covered the whole period, the Mesolithic through to the modern era. Um, and it's combining LIDAR, aerial photography, geological um, material, as well as historical and archaeological um, stuff and trying to get the, the, all the different data sets to mesh together to get an idea of what's going on. And it can actually tell us quite a bit of what, about what's going on in the medieval period in this area. So um, you've obviously got the modern map there in the centre of your screen. Um, on the right hand side is uh, the LIDAR that I processed um, from this coastal zone. And you can see that that blue colouring is really everything around about one and a half to two metres OD. Turns green somewhere around two and a half metres OD. Um, and we'll get on to why um, there are these bands of green, particularly in the north, a little bit later in today's uh, talk. So, uh, reconstructing the evolution of the linkage coastline in the medieval period. Well, at the start of the medieval era, there does seem to have been a significant flooding event that saw the sea encroaching in this region. You can see it in the Fenland, um, you've got um, evidence for marine transgression there up to about 4.5 metres at OD. So quite high um, and dated into this period, 4th to 6th centuries approximately. And while we don't have good dated transgressions in the Lincolnshire marshes yet. Uh, we do have Romano-British sites that are clearly covered by quite significant quantities of marine alluvium, which suggests that something very similar is going on here. So at Skegness, Adelthorpe, Ingermells, uh, that Mel's word that uh, David um, was talking about earlier, um, you have salt making sites near to the coast as it currently exists and they're buried by between a metre and two metres of marine alluvium, suggesting a very significant flooding event. Uh, that's your red star on the map there. Um, a bit further north, um, you have Romano-British settlement sites suggesting that um, where the yellow stars are near modern day Louth, between Louth and Summercoats, there was probably something approaching dry land in the Romano-British period because there seem to be settlements there. We've got Samian ware and other good quality imported pottery from those sites. Um, and these are buried again by alluvium. At Scupholm, there's 12 foot of marine alluvium lying on top of the Romano-British finds, a little bit less, two to three metres at Salt Fleet B. Um, in both cases, so we need to be slightly cautious about just the sheer depth of flooding we're talking about, because some of these may have been dumps from settlements into um, creeks that were semi-dry in the Romano-British period filled up. So you may be adding an extra metre. So really, it's it's a similar picture across the whole of this wide expanse, 10 kilometres wide, we're seeing a significant flooding event that buries Romano British sites. Now you can see that if you go to the British Geological Society site, um, they've got their online map viewer, um, and you can see for yourself, they map in yellow post-Roman marine alluvium. And sticking up through this are um, 
islands in certain parts of that marsh. This here is looking at Anderby, Cumberworth, Hutoft area, islands of glacial deposits sticking up from Sea of Yellow, which are marine deposits probably laid down by salt marsh. And as, as I say here, it's a landscape of lost creeks and islands. Um, now, this has been well known, but the question of what it actually looked like though has been rather more difficult to get at. But I think Using LIDAR and various other things, we can begin to get a much more accurate picture, both of the extent of the islands and the underlying geography of the Anglo-Saxon salt marshes that we see here. Um, so here is a LIDAR process of the same thing. And you can see if we just flick backwards and forwards, there's significantly more islands mapped um, from the LIDAR and recent work on the um, um, Holocene geology of this area suggests that these are all genuine till islands. It's just more of them than the British Geological Society has previously pulled up. And they're sticking through um, sea level there. Dark blue is um, zero metres OD. Light blue is two metres OD on this. Um, if you combine this LIDAR material, it doesn't just show us the true extent of the islands that would have stuck up in the Anglo-Saxon period through this salt marsh. It also lets us see some of the creeks. Um, this is the same landscape um, once I've gone through all the LIDAR material, um, I've gone through the geology and the aerial photographs, and you can see some really quite huge creeks crisscrossing this landscape, which are quite interesting. Um, I say that it's the, the channels of the final major phase of marine flooding. Um, there is some evidence for later flooding, but it seems to be very much localised and produces downcut channels um, within the salt marsh deposits. Whereas those creeks that you're seeing there are roddens of the kind that you might see um, in the Fenland normally. In the Fenland, they stand a bit higher than they do at the marsh, uh, probably due to a lack of generalised peat across the area. Um, but um, in general, you, you can get a sense of some absolutely huge creeks. Um, and it gets even more interesting if we move a little bit further south, south of that group of islands. So from Chapel St. Leonard's down to Skeg Ness, we have this wide expanse mapped by the British Geological Society uh, with not very much going on in it. Um, now, this is the same area on the LIDAR. And you can see if you squint, um, there are curls and twists in some of that LIDAR data suggesting something's going on. But the basic LIDAR that is produced uh, by Steve Malone's project on, of Fenland LIDAR, for example, doesn't show up the creeks very easily. However, once you start digging into it and adjusting the LIDAR um, boundaries so you, you can really start to see what's happening down there, these creeks start to pop out. And this is in fact what we seem to have as the underlying um, map of, if you like, the last final major marine flooding event in the Lincolnshire marshes. We end up with a massive set of channels and some of these are absolutely huge. Uh, that one running through the centre of your screen from the um, east coast, just between Adelthorpe and Chapel St Leonard's, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but hopefully you can. Um, this one and then running down south and coming out at Wainfleet, it varies between about 250 and 400 metres wide. So an absolutely huge channel. And then you have secondary um, channels coming off here between around 60 and 100 metres wide. So a massive marshland landscape. Now, obviously, difficult to see on the original LIDAR there. So I'll just show you where some of this comes from before talking about it, how it is exploited. So um, this is the um, same view of LIDAR focused around Orby. Um, so it would be it's this area here, assuming you can see my mouse pointer. Um, and you can see where previously it was hard to see. If you adjust the LIDAR, you can see these rodents starting to emerge. Um, they're not just present in the LIDAR data though, um, they're also present on aerial photographs. So the same area you have, this is one of the secondary um, 
channels that you can see and it's around 80 60 to 80 meters wide and here i've added black lines just to make clear the distinction but this is about um 250 meters wide that's the main channel that you can see there at orby and just below you can see one of the uh, channels coming off it nicely seen in the aerial photographs uh you also see it in uh, geophysical and so on work that has been done out on the um habitoff um, marshes. So this here, you can see this. This is the same channel that was visible on the aerial photographs, the secondary channel, um, and it's around about 80 meters wide at that point. Um, now, the geological evidence, when I combined this in with the lidar and the other material, suggests that some of these channels are extremely old. That main channel that you're seeing there, the base of it lies as low as 11.9 minus 11.9 meters OD, which suggests it flooded probably sometime in the, uh, the Mesolithic period originally. Um, so extremely ancient but persistent channels that were still leaving their traces in in effect, the post-Roman era. Um, and you can see that some of the Iron Age and Romano-British material that's been found in the area, all those um, are um, triangles, are salt-making sites of the Iron Age in orange and Romano-British period in yellow and unclear in <laughs> half and half. Um, they match up relatively nicely with what can still be seen on the surface as after the latest period of marine flooding. These do seem to be fairly persistent channels. Um, now, the key, key question you want, uh, we want to know, obviously, is how long did they last? If the final flood deposits date, perhaps 6th, 7th century, something like that, how long did these creeks continue to be a presence in the countryside um, of the Lincolnshire Marsh? And the answer seems to be for quite a long time. The large channel, I think I've managed to identify its name. It's the Shall Fleet, the Shallow Estuary, I think it means in this uh, period, uh, which is mentioned in the Bull Marsh and um, Orby and Adelthorpe court rolls as constantly being in need of its banks maintained to avoid disastrous flooding of the surrounding landscape uh, from the 12th through to the 15th century. Very few mentions in the 15th century, which is probably significant. Um, you also get um, the archaeological material from the medieval period. Um, Middle and late Saxon seems to be the very earliest, and that's found on the channel banks in this kind of area and just to the south here. So there's some suggestion that there is some middle to late Anglo-Saxon activity in the marshes in that period, and it's located with reference to this major channel. Um, you have these slightly raised bumps. Now, they've not previously been particularly noted, but in the last few years, um, they've been described in two ways. One way was to describe them as levees, but they're discontinuous. They don't go all the way, and, I, and they're too thick, really, in my view, to be um, simple banks of the kind mentioned in the, court, uh, the Manor Court Rolls. Um, more plausible, very recently the Triton Knoll work has suggested that they can be fairly confidently identified as medieval Sultan mounds, reflecting the sand washing technique that's used in Marsh Chapel and uh, Wainfleet areas from at least the 12th century onwards. So that suggests that they were still marine channels that late on. And finally, down here, you can see the village of Ashington, which uh, that green line there shows how it was laid over the top of the junction of this um, major channel with some of the secondary roddens. Um, a couple of interesting points here. Ashington is first mentioned um, around about 13th century and the pottery appears to be late 12th century to 15th century. But the house sites we have all appear to be either on the edge of that main channel or just away from it. And I think that's potentially quite significant. I've actually got a nice crop mark here of Ashington uh, that's visible on Google Earth. There's an even nicer one visible on Apple Maps, but their copyright terms are not quite so generous as Google Earth's ones. So you get the Google Earth version. Um, and it suggests to me that there's quite a lot of water management going on in this area. And that fits quite nicely with some of the very straight nature of the channels here um and i can talk about a bit uh, that a bit later if, if anyone would like um 
But I think we definitely we've got these major channels at least having significant marine activity into the 12th century. Um, at the other end of Sh um, Shalfet, we get a s similar evidence appearing. This is between uh, Chapel St. Leonard's in the north, major holiday um, area now, and Adelthorpe. That's the Adelthorpe Hall, a previously unrecognised Till Island with a medieval and early modern hall on it. Um, and Ingemel's just to the south. Um, Dudik, um, this is the mouth of it, about 400 metres wide of the Shalflet. Dudik is in yellow here and it is mentioned in the 12th to early uh, 15th century, roughly, as a sea bank. But it's a very odd sea bank, as you can see, because it runs... Um, not parallel to the uh, to the modern coast, but directly inland, which suggests that there was a definite need for a sea bank in that period, and work is constantly being done on it to maintain it through the 12th to 14th centuries. Um, interestingly, the channel itself is preserved in the modern field boundaries as well. But what's particularly interesting is we have what looks like medieval bridge and furrow laid out of par over part of the channel mouth. And that's probably late medieval reclamation of the channel mouth as it finally ceases to be a significant marine area. And you can see that if I zoom in a bit closer on the LIDAR, um, you can see that it looks like there was probably um, a secondary bank and then medieval ridge and furrow laid out over part of the mouth there. Now, so we have some really interesting evidence for um, a remarkable amount of marine um, input in quite late in the medieval period in the southern area around Skegness. Further north, we don't have um, so much evidence for actual settlement on the marsh and water management in those areas. Most of the settlement, if you go north, appears to be located on these islands. Um, nowadays, they look like slight rises. If you've ever driven from Alford to Chapel St. Leonard's in Lincolnshire, uh, used by a lot of coast traffic, the slight rises as you hit some of these islands in yellow, but it feels like nothing more than a minor hill. But originally they were islands of till and gravel, and they were occupied from the early Anglo-Saxon period at the latest. There's late Roman material on some of them. There's early Anglo-Saxon material, like that rather lovely gold uh, pendant found one of these down by Chapel St. Leonard's, suggesting significant uh, burial activity in that period, because we've also found other gold beads and various other things from that site. Um, and we have a few specific islands that are particularly interesting. Some of these lay just on the edge of the coastal zone. This is Little Carlton, um, which is near Louth, laid right at the very edge of the coastal zone. You can trace a major creek coming just into this kind of area in um, the early medieval period. Um, obviously, it's a fairly famous site. You can see it is slightly higher than the main Middle Marsh, but the creeks come very close to it. And you will have seen on TV, I believe, as well as in, on, in the newspapers, about the tremendous finds that come from this island site, including 530 medieval, early medieval sign, um, sites on the PAS, over a thousand now, including from excavations, um, including styluses, lovely um, um, Middle Saxon glass mounts as well. So something clearly very significant was going on on that island. Out into the marsh proper at Stain Hill, and you can see just how incredible this network of creeks would have been in the pre-Viking period here. Um, immensely wide creeks getting on for a kilometre wide at their mouth at Thedlethorpe. Um, and Stainhill was a high island sitting in the middle of this creek system. There's Roman activity on this site. Um, it's got the highest concentration of Roman coins in East Lincolnshire currently known from there. And there is a ladder enclosure on there, which in Lincolnshire is usually associated with villa sites on the Wolds. So maybe something similar might be seen at this site. Then again, we have Middle Saxon finds similar to what we're getting at Little Carlton. Um, significant quantities yet again and I would suggest it's probably some kind of estate centre particularly as there's a Sutton to its south a directional name that suggests Middle Saxon uh, centrality for the place to its north um, and that's how the British Geological Survey mapped it and the crop marks I can see on Google Maps 
the actual LIDAR pushes the edge north of where the British Geological Society to where the edge of a crop marks up here. So it looks like there's water management in the medieval period here, and it does become a medieval village with a chapel that continues to function into the 15th century. Um, going even further north, we have um, this, this area near to Lauf, this wide expanse of low-lying marsh with a band of higher ground that I mentioned at the beginning. It's green and yellow here and has this lumpy look. It's well known as um, a thick band of um, medieval sandwashing Sultan mounds. Uh, give you a slightly closer look there. Now, it's been mapped previously by the British Geological Society and from aerial photographs, but LIDAR actually gives you a much better idea of what its extent was. Um, interestingly, the LIDAR matches up remarkably well with Haywood's 1595 mapping of the same area. If you drop the LIDAR in, it needs very little adjustment to match up with the salt-making mounds that were visible in 1595 which is interesting both of the quality of the mapping then and also because it suggests that obviously there was very little salt making taking place after 1595 because there were no new mounds. It's thought that the earliest mounds are on the left hand side to the west, latest to the east. Um, and as each um, mound was um, created, the sea um, coast moved slightly to the east and new mounds were gradually built up, building up this thick band that you've seen. Now, the LIDAR in this area actually answers some interesting questions about the dating and chronology of these um, areas. In particular, notice those two big gaps in the distribution of sultans, which aren't filled by any other mapping of the sultan sites. Um, it matches up remarkably well with the creek system that we can reconstruct from the LIDAR. Um, so that one there at between North Coates and Marsh Chapel matches up with that giant creek that we see coming in here, which is the earlier um, um, river that runs past Tetney towards Wath. Um, nowadays it has a much different route, that same river coming in from the north through Tetney Haven, but in the early medieval period it appears to have come in here where you can see traces of it the other side of the Sultans and then here through North Coates to Tetney. And then the second one at Marsh Chapel the Waterlade and Landike rivers, they appear to have originally joined as a large creek in that area too. Um, this actually answers, as I say, some interesting questions about this landscape. This is roughly a look of what it might have been around about AD 900. The Red Triangle is um, Helen's famous late Saxon Sultan site, which we can see now sits on one of these major creeks. And then there's some higher ground visible on the LIDAR, which is probably the original edge of a Romano British coastline, slightly drier and suitable for um, resettlement as we enter the late Saxon Anglo Scandinavian period. If you then plot in the early sand washing salt mounds, which used a different technique to uh, the late Saxon site, which had a technique of salt production more like the Romano-British technique, the medieval sand washing sites respect, as I say, these creeks. They're located in association with them and they leave big gaps. This northern creek here, um, which is the one that goes to Tetney, is recorded from the 12th century as the port of North Coates, and it seems to continue functioning as a port into the 14th century at least, if not a little bit later. Um, and we have these gaps. It suggests these sultans were built well before any possible sea bank um, was in place, and these channels, major channels, continue to run through this area. The one place where I think we might have early sea banks is around Grainthorpe. If I just zoom in there, these are the suggested early sea banks around Grainthorpe. Um, and it's always been slightly confusing why we seem to have two sea banks at Grainthorpe. Um, one on the north, uh, one on the east, one on the west. Well, I think that's probably because when that that is probably the earliest sea bank. Grainthorpe is the only settlement in this area mentioned at Doomsday, um, and I think it had risk of flooding from both sides. This giant creek that we can see on the um, east, and also the main sea to uh, sorry on the west and the main sea to the east. Um, 
it seems to have been reclaimed a lot of land around Grainford with quite a deal of rapidity. The purple and the red here represent medieval agricultural crop marks and activity that we can identify. And you can see there's quite a lot of it between these sea banks, but also both to the east and west of it. Um, this situation seems to continue for quite a time, I would say. I would suggest it maybe goes even into the 13th century before the sea banks are completed completely all the way up, blocking off, first of all, the Marsh Chapel Channel, and then probably in the 13th century, the North Coast one, leaving a much foreshortened North Coast port. Um, you can also incidentally see the effect that sea banks have on the landscape. High bank has always been questioned, um, no, um, east of Grainthorpe, always been saying, is this medieval? Is it early modern? I think it probably is medieval because you can see in the LIDAR um, similar ground heights to its um, west um, as is found further inland, whereas the marsh is a good half a metre higher or so um, on the east of that. Um, it's not just a tale of the occupation of landscape, though. As with uh, David's presentation on the sand dune sites um, and the depredations they suffered from the sea, we have a similar tale for those settlements that were established right on the coast. Um, it's thought that the settlements were relatively left alone by the sea until the 13th century, when a barrier um, system of islands or islets of sand and gravel off the coast, uh, partially left as a result of a glacial moraine out there from the last ice age, they seem to have been destroyed in the 13th century, leaving uh, and the material deposited on the beach um, front and the coast of Lincolnshire. You can see some of these mapped by the British Geological Society and OSL dating of the sand dunes suggests they were formed about 700 years ago here, just the time that's suggested for the destruction of these barrier islands and their throwing up on the modern coastline. Um, Simon Pawley puts it quite nicely, a coastline sheltered for four and a half millennia and topographically and geologically unprepared for the experience was now exposed to whatever force of tide and weather had formerly operated on the line of barrier islands. Floods and coastal disasters were the inevitable results, especially in what's been termed the stormy centuries of the 13th and 14th centuries. And yeah, I, th I think this probably is exactly what happened. These coast, the, the, the most coastal settlements from Mablethorpe down to Skegness were founded on dried out salt marsh and this eroded relatively rapidly once it was exposed to the sea. So here at Mablethorpe, the church is rent asunder by the waves of the sea in 1287. Um, Pagnaby Abbey Chronicle says that the church was wholly destroyed um, gets even worse in 1288 a flood of sea reaches in as far as Maltby field so right up to um, covering the whole of the marshland to totally destroy the church of St Peter of Mablethorpe and that day perished many men on counted sheep and an unknown number of cattle. Um, in fact the church it appears to be maybe 500 meters or so offshore of the current coastline so suggesting significant coastal erosion and you could actually see the church ruins at ex extremely low tides from the dune top at Mobile as late as the 1870s and metal detectors there have pulled up some material that would seem to support the idea um, that there was a village out here. There's a few of them found by the metal detectorist Dave Lascelles uh, working out there at the very lowest possible tides. Uh, Skegness seems to have suffered a similar fate. Uh, Skegness is um, it's got a doomsday name of trick, which Richard Coates plausibly, in my view, has argued derives from Latin and made perhaps via Welsh, meaning crossing point or ferry. Um, field names in Ingemel's court rolls um, have the Castor, Chester element suggesting a Roman settlement and land in the 16th century mentions a town walled having also a castle. Now, this has been thought to imply a Roman fortified site and finds of the Roman period on the Skegness foreshore, including intriguingly a brothel token, um, do offer some support for this. But we don't just have to believe the land when he says there was a town there. Um, the accounts for Tattershall Castle further inland in Lincolnshire show um, 
imported wood and um, wainscots from the Baltic arriving by Skegness. And Skegness is mentioned in the late 12th century. The where Skegness, which is at the end of Lindsay, where there is a good port. And finally, fishermen um, complaining about the uh, the church at Skegness catching their nets into the mid 17th century. So we can have fair confidence. Significant settlements were lost. As to where Skegness lies, the original Skegness Pier is thought to roughly have the point at its end where it was, maybe a few hundred metres offshore. Now, David Robinson suggested that the orange land you can see there um, was the land that was lost in the medieval period. Um, that's probably reasonably plausible. There seems to be a, um, a spit um, coming out protecting Skegness with two hamlets, um, Mells, east and west Mells, sand, um, in sand dunes on that spit. They were lost as well in the 16th century, though perhaps something more akin to that would be what we would expect in the early medieval period. In, so you can see significant portions of land lost in this area in that period too. So it's a tale of loss and gain in Lincolnshire. OK, I will call a halt to it there. <laughs>